Courtney, are you all set? You get going? Good morning, everyone. So, um, welcome back to the second international conference of the Sustainable Consumption and Nutrition Action Initiative. Uh, also, welcome to members of the local and campus community who have joined us this morning. Uh, we were very happy to be able to open all of our keynotes to the public um, with a very generous sponsorship of several units across campus. Um, before I recognize those groups, I want to just turn the floor over to my colleague, Maury Cohen, uh, who is going to just make a quick announcement. Okay, thank, thank you, Cindy. I just wanted to uh, briefly draw attention to the fact that uh, one of the other extracurricular activities that I'm involved in when I'm not working on Sporai things um, is, uh, is editor of a journal that some of you may be familiar with called Sustainability, Science, Practice, and Policy. Um, and um, I don't know, how long ago, how long have you been writing these blogs, Ethan? Okay, so five and a half years ago, we had the idea to create a, a blog in conjunction with the journal as a way of um, creating a wider uh, readership um, above and beyond people within the immediate academic community. Um, the blog has become so wildly successful that it, in many respects, um, has come to outshine the academic content of the journal. And there's a lesson there. But, uh, but according to, uh, to the extent that you put your, your faith into Google metrics, um, the SSPP blog is now one of the most popular internet sites on um, environment and sustainability issues. Um, and the uh, credit for that has nothing to do with me. Um, we have good pleasure today to have with us uh, Ethan Goffman, who has uh, refashioned himself over the last uh, five years or so as a professional journalist. And uh, I don't know how he does it, but every week with religious precision, uh, posts a uh, hugely insightful piece. Um, and while the conference is going on, um, Ethan started yesterday posting and blogging in real time. And so if you visit the, uh, the URL posted there, um, you'll be able to keep up uh, with some of Ethan's reporting. So he's posted overnight while all of you were um, cavorting around or uh, relaxing. Ethan was hard at work trying to make sense of some of yesterday's events um, and to digest them out and put them out to a, to a wider readership. Um, so yesterday's uh, activities, or some of yesterday's activities, have been, uh, have been posted, and Ethan will keep that going for the duration of the conference, and I suppose it'll probably carry on for several days afterwards. So if you're not familiar with the journal, or you're not familiar with, uh, with Ethan's blog, uh, please take an opportunity to, uh, to check out what he had to say about yesterday's events and uh, if you have the time or inclination um, to do so in future days as well. So Ethan, great thank you very much for all of your incredibly hard work and uh, um, my sympathies for your missed flight the other day. <laughs> uh, but he did get here and uh, he will be continuing to work hard um, for the rest of the conference. Okay, so my uh, colleague uh, Helena Brown wanted to make a, a brief announcement as well. 
very brief. I just want to remind everybody that the SCORI website has a blog, and we, so far, I think I'm the only voice there. Uh, <laughs> roughly, roughly every three weeks or so, I post something. It's a personal observation. It's my my personal encounters with sustainable consumption. Uh, and uh, it would be great if there were more voices and more personal encounters for sustainable consumption. So I write about, about whatever was my city, my clothes, my retirement fund, my whatever, all in the context of the questions of growth, sustainability, uh, being a good citizen or not, and so on. So send those and read mine. <laughs> Okay, so um, without further ado, let's get to our keynote speaker. So again, I'm very happy to um, thank our sponsors. And as you all know, um, each keynote was sponsored by a specific group here on campus. Um, uh, sorry, we're out of order. But, it's again. but and today's lecture is sponsored by a group called the um, Senator George J. Mitchell Center for Sustainability Studies. And I am really happy to have with us today, I, okay, nothing to see over there. <laughs> uh, I'm really happy to have with us today a, a good friend of mine, a colleague, and, and um, a, a really wonderful mentor, uh, Dr. David Hart, who is the director of, of the center. Um, do, David uh, demonstrates an absolutely exceptional and strong commitment to research that has a purpose to research that's designed to directly address community-based needs, oftentimes in response to stakeholder-identified issues. He is an absolute master at pulling together it maybe um, not always obvious interdisciplinary teams, people from all across campus, not only here at UMaine, but also with partner institutions at the University of New Hampshire, Vermont, um, across New England, to find the right people to work on really messy, complicated, complex issues. And I, I think he's done a really exceptional job of doing that. Um, David has a couple of really interesting projects um, that he's helping to lead with the New England Sustainability Consortium, including uh, a $6 million Safe Beaches and Shellfish Initiative, and a, a more recent uh, initiative called the Future of Dams, also a $6 million project um, with the Sustainability Consortium. Um, I'm very fortunate to work with David. We have a research group on uh, materials management in Maine. Um, and David has been a, a, an important part of that team. So um, I hope you'll join me in welcoming uh, Dr. David Hart. Uh, I have to observe that Cindy's introducing me. I'm going to introduce someone who's going to introduce Cindy this morning, so uh, you can all go out and get coffee or something. Um, so when see mine. It was on the desktop. Yes. Um, so when Cindy invited me to, uh, or actually invited us to be a sponsor of the Mission Center uh, for this morning's keynote speaker, uh, it was a great honor, uh, not the least because we've been following uh, Dr. Reich's work for some time, and, and you'll hear from someone who's, uh, whose own research has been profoundly influenced uh, by who's been profoundly influenced by Dr. Reich, uh, but uh, I knew I'd be in the company of some amazing scholars here uh, doing work on sustainable consumption. Uh, so I was looking forward to just having the chance to, to hang out and learn a lot. Uh, what Cindy didn't tell me, however, was that I would be in the company of such an extraordinary group of performing performance artists. <laughs> uh, uh, not just uh, stirring songs, uh, protest songs of Bob Marley, uh, 
uh, but vegetable rights, uh, didn't see that one coming. Uh, uh, some of the best klezmer clarinet I've heard in quite a long time, uh, Sonoran Desert Poetry, and uh, I wasn't able to stay till the very end, but uh, I saw that the contra dancing was getting up to a great start. And I, I want to say there are skeptics out there about a lot of the things about our future, um, people who reject the idea that we can dance our way to a sustainable future, but I'm not one of those skeptics. I have great hope for that. Uh, so uh, I will say that uh, what we do at the Mitchell Center is very strongly aligned with uh, your work. You talk about research and action. We talk about linking knowledge with action. Clearly, uh, we have the shared desire to create a sustainable world, and the real question is, how do we get there from here? Um, listening to all of you talk, uh, it's pretty obvious that we have plenty of work to do because there's a lot, lot at play here, right? We have diverse uh, values, goals, processes, belief systems, research needs, uh, and ultimately uh, putting this into play, into action. And uh, so, Listening to some of the keynotes in the, uh, uh, remind me, as, as many keynotes do, that this is going to be tough work, that we um, uh, face a lot of challenges on the road to solutions. And the question is, how can we get the kind of collective action that we need? How can we uh, help to catalyze the social movements that are needed for this kind of work? Um, we here uh, at, uh, at the University of Maine, at the Mitchell Center, we've been trying to figure out how universities as a whole, as opposed to individual scholars, might play a bigger role in doing this. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we've done and what we've learned. Um, so we're really committed to focusing on real world problems. There's some scholarship that kind of goes in its own direction, but we always try to bring it back to the problems at hand. Uh, working with partners out in the real world, if you will, who wrestle with these problems every day in their lives and livelihoods. Um, Bringing together, I mean, one of the strengths of universities is this incredible breadth and depth of expertise, all of which is relevant to the multifaceted sustainability problems we face. How do we mobilize that and, and use it effectively? And how do we stay focused for the long haul uh, on solutions? So we've been sort of practicing this, a uh, little bit of an experiment institutionally. We've created a portfolio of projects and partnerships focused on everything from renewable energy to climate adaptation, agriculture, fisheries, water resources, um, urban planning, transportation. And uh, in all of these, we've kind of assembled interdisciplinary teams uh, working with stakeholders that align with the context of the problems and the expertise that's needed. Um, you'll be happy to know that we've drawn heavily on uh, what I would call a human dimensions expertise. This is just a partial list of the faculties expertise, human dimensions maybe being both social sciences and some of the humanities, uh, maybe even more than the biophysical, although the whole point is to combine our understanding of social and environmental systems. So teams of faculty maybe and, and students maybe typically five to ten on a team working with stakeholders. Um, we've worked with over 300 stakeholder organizations to date and they almost always involve a mix of business and industry, uh, non-governmental organizations, all levels of government, uh, other parts of civil society. Uh, these are partnerships that need to be uh, based on mutual respect, trust, long, long-lasting partnerships. We're, we're trying to do this for the long haul. Um, we are, at least for now, uh, have some evidence that it helps to use this kind of co-production process in which things like knowledge brokering, which our speaker, our keynote today, is certainly an expert in, we talk about boundary work and boundary spanning, um, this idea of linking knowledge with action. It's almost a hypothesis whether this, when and where this approach might be more useful. I will say that this kind of iterative process, uh, working with stakeholders, has caused us to do a lot more listening and to be a lot more humble about the value of our expertise relative to the knowledge and know-how that all our partners have. Um, we've been, as Cindy mentioned, we've been kind of uh, growing our capacity for this. Uh, uh, the first meeting probably wasn't more than two of these tables with the faculty sitting around talking. Uh, we're now up to over 150 faculty, um, hundreds of students, over 300 stakeholder partners. Uh, we, got, we got lucky early on and got a $20 million grant from our National Science Foundation who probably didn't quite understand what we were setting out to do, uh, but we're grateful for that. And, and two subsequent NSS grants uh, for $6 million that City mentioned. 
<laughs> um, one of the interesting things, and uh, there's actually a, a couple papers on the table back there uh, near the registration where you can learn more. We view this as an experiment. It's a kind of an organizational and institutional experiment to make universities more useful partners to society. So if it's an experiment, we should study it, right? In other words, we don't quite know how it's going to work. We're going to make mistakes. We'll probably have some failures. And we need to learn the best practices. So we've, all the way along, we've studied this. This is just three of about 30 papers published to date just on that part of our work, on the part about uh, stakeholder engagement, about interdisciplinary collaboration. So basically, a bunch of social scientists study the teams and how they collaborate and what works and doesn't work. Um, total of about 300 papers to date across all our work. So, the le perhaps the most important lesson we've learned to date uh, really was articulated a long time ago in an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. <coughs> but if you want to go far, go together. I wish I it was going to turn out that the road to solutions was going to be short and straight. But I listened to your keynotes and a lot of others in my career, and it looks like you've got a long, winding road ahead, a lot of obstacles, some places we're going to have to back up and go a different way. And I, I think our most important lesson is we're going to have to do this together. We're going to have to mobilize across the whole breadth of expertise that exists in universities in conjunction with societal partners. We're going to have to stay with this for the long run. Um, one of the most exciting parts for me personally in all this work has been to see amazing committed faculty and students, especially the students, who are obviously the hope for the future because we're going to need multi-generational efforts to guide us on the right course here. And I just want to say that this is a small group. We used to be able to take a picture like this uh, years ago with a camera. Now we have about 10 times this many, and we take those pictures with satellite. So it's much more complicated, so I'm not showing it to you today. <laughs> but back a few years ago, out in the middle of this sea of people uh, was the next uh, person who's actually going to introduce our keynote speaker today, uh, Caroline Noblin. Uh, she's out in the middle there. She wasn't even a doctor yet because she was working on her PhD in behavioral economics. Uh, and she and many of the rest of us have been greatly inspired by the work of Dr. Reich. And so I'm going to turn it over to Caroline. Thanks, David. Um, wow. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Um, but it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Lucia Reich. Um, for most of us in this room, she really doesn't need an introduction. Um, her body of work, her passion for sustainability, and her ability to translate research into policy speaks for itself. But since I have the opportunity to say nice things about a fellow economist, I'm, I'm going to take it. Um, and because the School of Economics here at the University of Maine is happy to help co-sponsor what I know will be a really engaging keynote um, from Dr. Reich. So for those of you who are having the pleasure of being introduced to her for the first time, um, a couple of basics. Uh, Dr. Reich is a full professor at the Copenhagen Business School with ties to multiple institutions in her homeland of Germany. And she is editor-in-chief of the Journal of Consumer Policy. But most importantly, sort of at the, the heart of things, Dr. Reich is directly at that nexus of science and policy. And David used this word too, but people call her a knowledge broker. And I just love that term because it really shows where she's moving. With research projects, titled Enhancing the Connectivity Between Research and Policy Making and Sustainable Consumption that she has, we begin to understand her vision for moving sustainability into the policy realm. So through her role as the appointed chair of the German Advisory Council for Consumer Issues, her peer-elected lifelong membership of the German Academy of Science and Engineering, and many other positions of prominence, she is perfectly positioned to continue to be a leader at the interface between research, policy, and citizens. She directly informs policy at the highest levels on multiple aspects of sustainability. You've seen her do work in health, 
environmental behavior, food, and energy policy. Hers is the voice that leaders of state listen to. So she acts as a beacon of hope, but also an exemplar for all of us who long for our research to have direct and lasting impact. On a personal note, um, in addition to all of that outstanding scholarly work, many of us in the sustainability community have benefited from Dr. Reich's belief in supporting colleagues at all levels. Um, I had the great fortune of being asked to contribute a book chapter to the Handbook for research, of Research on Sustainable Consumption, edited by Dr. Reich and my research mentor, Dr. John Toberson, at the University of Aarhus. It was my first book chapter as first author, and I was so excited um, and even more nervous. <laughs> but I truly could not have asked for a more supportive and positive editor. Now, don't get me wrong, she'll keep you on the timeline, <laughs> but you will want to produce your best work for her because she has outdone herself in producing the best work upon which all of us stand. Over 400 publications of the highest quality and the longest of term impact. So perhaps the most important thing that I can say among all of these wonderful things is that she embodies the passion for sustainability that unites all of us. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lutz here. Thanks so much for that very kind introduction. So I'm trying to search for my... So let me use the time we use for the techniques to thank you, to thank my sponsors, and also to thank um, Cynthia and Sarah and all the others here. You have been immense, amazing hosts, and um, also with a very <laughs> caring host, and really made me feel very, uh, very privileged to be here and to uh, share some ideas with you. Yes, so this is actually a, oh, I have to stay here. I'm actually used to walk around, but I better stay right here so that you all hear me. Um, this is not a usual talk for me because I usually present my work on behavioral economics and sustainable consumption, sustainable development. But um, Philip actually nudged me kind of piece by piece with the salami tactic into doing something completely else, which is sharing with you some reflections on the, the policy research interface that I'm, I'm working on, working within, since uh, quite some time. This is also why I, you know, I'm not that much into, into titles, but I thought it's, you know, it makes sense to put, just to, to, to put you in the picture that besides my work at the Copenhagen Business School, um, I have several other um, work environments, which is mostly in, in Germany, uh, mostly in Berlin, and mostly with the German government. And one of that is a member of the German Council of Sustainable Development. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, also, the National Advisory Council of Consumer Affairs in Berlin, and also the German Bioeconomy Council. So I'm one of those uh, researchers who are spending uh, at least as much time outside the classroom, which is not like everyone, which is not my Danish uh, uh, employer, um, as in other environments. But I, why do I do it? I mean, this is of course all about your work, and this is because I do think it matters. Not always, and not every meeting, but uh, if you have a, um, if you want to go a long way, front, I really like that, uh, that saying. Uh, I think this is, it's, it's actually worth it. And I, I actually just read yesterday that American women spend 28 months of their life in front of the wardrobe, and that <laughs> French men spend uh, 26 months of their lives in traffic jams. 
So I thought, it's okay if I spend 20 months of my life in meetings, no kind of consults. Anyway, so it's a bit of a different talk, and I'm, I think I'm a little bit nervous because <laughs> this is not really on my work, but let's see whether that's uh, interesting for you. The guiding questions I also received from Philip is, or what does it take to promote the sustainability transformation? A big word. We probably speak of different things when we speak about the sustainability transformation. I basically, as I said yesterday in my talk, I'm a very pragmatic person. So I think now that we do have the SDGs, this is kind of a good common denominator where to meet and where to start. I'm not saying this is all, but it's a good kind of focus that uh, we, can, we can all uh, link and relate to. How to design a productive science policy interface? There's, there's several um, promoting and several <clears throat> hindering issues that I, on reflection, like to share with you on that. And then, of course, being a researcher, and I've never been into a political office, and I don't plan to be in one at any time. Um, what is the role of researchers, researchers as the honest brokers in, uh, in, that, in that game? First thing I think what's really helpful is a reliable sustainability governance. And uh, I think um, uh, when we, I talked to Sarah coming up here as that, as, as Germans, we are actually socialized, probably Ulf would, would uh, echo that, of not being proud of your country. I mean, like, you know, we don't do these. It has changed a little bit since the, the World Championship, right? <laughs> but, but this is how we're socialized, so we're not supposed to be, uh, to be proud. But I think one thing that Germany does pretty well is, besides the refugee crisis, is that it came up quite early with a quite reliable sustainability governance. And what do I mean with that? And this is now not comes a terrible slide, but I didn't really find a way to make it much better. Uh, is this is how sustainability is kind of institutionalized, and it's you know it's not completely unimportant. This is the, 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 the formal side, right? The governance side. Of course, there is all those very, very important NGOs and all this bottom up movement, but this is how it's actually institutionalized. And not to go, I don't want to go through all those details, but I think what is important, starting from the top left, yes, there is the Federal Statistical Office. What does it do? It does measure the indicators uh, um, laid down in our sustainable development strategy. And in the action plan, is there improvement? Right? And what you do, I mean, you only know that what you you can only steer and manage what you measure. So indicators are very important. So that's the the federal statistical office. Maybe it sounds funny that I start with it, but it is an important actor because it provides the numbers, it provides the evidence base. Of course, you have to make sure that the right things, the relevant things, are measured. Right? That's the trick. The German Sustainable, Sustainable Development Council, this is a council that does um, consult directly, the government directly, and uh, uh, as I'll show later on, it is comprised of uh, different uh, species, researchers like me, but there's also our biggest environmental um, organizations down there, the unions, the churches, industry, uh, development uh, um, um, entities and the, the nice thing is that it's really at an arm length from the chancellery and there is i mean you know, i would say direct but there is some influence and also the members are actually picked and appointed by the chancellor and that means something because she's a i mean um, you can like her or not but she's a woman of power then the parliamentary advisory council this is also important because these are the guys that's the parliament so that's the the legitimacy that's the, the democratic element that comes into that governance right so, so they are there it's a committee in the in the parliament and they do all kind of nice things like um, they make sure that uh, or they try to make sure that laws that are passed do go through a sustainability check they also are kind of the ambassadors in the parliament for the topic of sustainability and the, the, the leader of that committee is a very, very engaged young uh, member of parliament. Then we do have, because it's a federal state, we have the federal states, Melinda. And this is also important because um, 
they are very often often uh, the drivers. They, you know, they can push the agenda. They can try to be more, you know, more uh, pronounced on specific issues of sustainability. So they can really push uh, and, and in fact chase the the, uh, the federal government. And uh, one interesting thing is that one of the the uh, uh, the lender, one of the federal states, is it's the first and the only one with a Green Party prime uh, prime minister with a Green Party government, which is quite exciting. And the most interesting thing is that this is one of the most economic, um, economically strongest states with the world headquarter of Mercedes-Benz and Porsche and Daimler and, and, and Bosch and, you know, you name it. It's, it's a car country, it's a car state. And uh, the interesting thing is that, um, you know, the economy doesn't collapse. There is a strong sustainability drive and this itself is a good example of how transitions might work and also of course it's, it's like a, a, a almost like a field experiment that is currently ongoing so they are also important and then the the cities the municipalities I strongly believe and I really enjoyed the talks yesterday that the cities are kind of the, the uh, incubators and of, of new lifestyles and of changes in the creating livable um, uh, surroundings. Yeah, I think, uh, and maybe this, the second thing that I, I, uh, I want to point out in that slide is that all the departments are equal. So this is not a thing just from the Department of Environment. No, there is a, what they call the Green Cabinet. And these are the, uh, the, um, the heads of all the departments. They have to be there. And like uh, about six months ago, there was a half-day meeting on sustainable consumption. They all have to be there. I mean, you can see that there's some come with more interest and others come with less interest. Um, but it is, I mean, um, at least it's on the agenda. And there is some sense of, of, uh, of ownership also because they're about to decide on, on issues. Yes. I think you deserve some pictures, and we do. <laughs> this is uh, not the Green Cabinet, that's the head of the Green Cabinet, because that's our, our chancellor, but they do meet here in, uh, in the chancellery. And uh, as I said, um, they have, I mean, it's, it's, it is, don't get me wrong, I mean, it's not all, you know, it's not, it's not all golden, it's not all uh, the pure success, and of course they have vested interests. And of course their lobby, lobby interests uh, uh, in their in the, in the way, but uh, the, the the sheer fact that there are institutions that regularly talk about it, have a plan, have an action plan, have to report back, that is an entry for many, also for for NGOs and also for this, for civil society to kind of link to, to talk to, to invite to, and to create networks. <laughs> That's the, uh, that, that was last week. We, we thought uh, that was, uh, I thought that's kind of a fun thing. Uh, that's the head of the parliamentary committee. And what we did is we took the, uh, the SDG goals in little cubes with us. That's within our parliament, the Bundestag, Eistag. And uh, we, we talked to the members of parliament and asked them to choose one uh, uh, that they could relate to or think <laughs> This is something I can actually do change with, and we made little videos, and they're now on. On the, you know, everyone can watch them. So also the voters back home can watch them. And so they kind of committed themselves to work on one of those uh, of those goals uh, primarily. So these are little. I mean, talking about action, right? So these are little things you can do to um, well bring the sustainability agenda here. Very very. I kind of you can even I mean, grab it, grab those goals, and you know, get pictures with it to bring it to uh, on the agenda. This is the Council for Sustainable Development, and once a year, uh, the uh, the chancellor comes to our yearly convention. It's about a thousand people in Berlin, and this is where she delivers her key speech for sustainable development for the next year. So, what she's kind of trying to do, and you might have heard of uh, her stand on the refugee. Issue refugee crisis, and um, so this year it was the focus was indeed also on how to link um, politically uh, those those two um, well, issues: climate change and dealing with the refugee crisis. 
um, within uh, the, the, the big umbrella of the sustainable development goals. Okay, enough pictures, here's the paper. <laughs> this is, um, yeah, so Germany does have, since 2002, a sustainable development strategy. It was now changed just two weeks ago <laughs> to be aligned with the sustainable development goals. Uh, which I think makes a lot of sense and which I would actually really recommend also to other governments because this is where the world needs and this is also where the kind of development and work uh, can can be uh, combined. Um, this, that's uh, the, the, the goal 12, sustainable consumption and production. And what we also have since very recently, since uh, I think four weeks, is a national program on sustainable consumption. Huh. So yeah, this is, this is, I think it's the only uh, the only country I'm aware of that really has a <coughs> plan that will be <coughs> that is currently transferred into an action plan, which means action plans means tasks, goals, tasks, money, a timeline, and reporting. So this is what you want to have, right? I mean, otherwise um, it's not complete enough. And uh, of course, it's always I mean, is the class half full or half Empty. It depends on where you where you where you stand, what you expect, but it's at least on track, and we can develop. Okay, that was the the first point: a reliable sustainability governance. And I'm not saying you have to have it, but it does. It is helpful because it reminds people, and it creates submarines, and it creates arenas where the issues are you know, taken uh, serious. Of course, um, and that looks up to my last slide, the supporting global agenda is very, very helpful. It must be, I'm, I'm aware that you cannot read it. That's the goal 12, ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. Just to remind you that there's, we had the discussion yesterday, what do you mean with sustainable consumption? I mean, this is, this is kind of, you know, I mean, it's not perfect again, but, but this is what we could start to work with together. And they, these are small things. It's about reducing food waste. It's about reducing chemicals. It's about <coughs> reducing reporting. It's about increasing information and awareness, um, supporting development countries, and uh, uh, looking into more efficient fossil fuel. Uh, no, looking into fossil fuel subsidies. I mean, there's bigger issues and smaller issues, but there is something to start with. And that, in in the, the case of Germany, that translated already. In <clears throat> including indicators for sustainable consumption that have not been in there. And I mean, it's maybe not that exciting, but I think it is exciting because, again, you can only steer and debate what you measure, what you look at. I mean, everyone you know, in business uh, would, would probably knows, knows what I mean. So now we have three new indicators that have not been measured, that means there is not, you know, data is not still there, but the moment that data is created, people will use it, researchers might use it, um, so it's a lot also about data creation. So now there will, there's an indicator on uh, the percentages of uh, products and services with governmentally um, run sustainability labels, then another indicator is the energy use and CO2 emissions of consumption. And another indicator is uh, uh, the, um, the extent of environmental management, EMAS, which is a European uh, standard for environmentally well uh, management um, for sustainable production. So this is the beginning. I must say I was really disappointed because I was in the group preparing the, the, this indicator group in, I mean, for instance, why not using uh, the um, um, amount of meat consumption, for instance? I mean, that would be something very concrete and that you know, could have been. But that was, I mean, there was the Ministry of the um, Agriculture and Food was would not go with that. But, I mean, that's, again, the long way. I don't know. I mean, this is going to be a review. We have a peer review every three or four years like external peer review from international colleagues that look at what has been reached and what has not been reached. And you know, the next step might be including a meat indicator or other ones. So you know, sometimes people think I'm not um, 
Um, I'm too patient. <laughs> I'm a drummy, but I often pretend to be, and I, <laughs> I'm, a, but I'm, I'm definitely a friend of, uh, of small steps because I, I'm, I think just being the, or maybe I became very realistic in um, being involved in, in uh, policy consultancy for about two decades. So it's there, it's small, it's not the right thing, but it's there and it's gonna change. <laughs> okay. Of course, what we also need is an independent research community, and I think that this is also something that uh, has been well prepared in, in, in Germany, and I'm not sure whether there's people from these independent environmental research institutes here in the room, but you might, I mean, Wuppertal Institute is quite well known, the Öko Institute is quite well known, they have been there for decades, and they're doing really high quality research. And this is on top of all the university uh, uh, academic kind of you know, normal uh, um, academic production. And they are very important because they have different types of sources. Um, speaking about research programs, they can also, some of them are member, member uh, ship uh, finance. So they can be much more radical because they, they don't really have to, to use what's out there um, on, on available research programs. Okay, I'm, I think I've got a few that one. Um, when, you, when we talk about the policy research interface, uh, I think there is, uh, we often talk about uh, two worlds, two arenas. And when you, you mentioned the, uh, this one EU project corpus of mine, when we really looked into that, how to, how to work on that uh, interface, the knowledge brokerage, and these are things that all of you who are on that interface probably know very well. It's about different interests, right? I mean, we have theories, methods, and concepts versus Solutions. Politicians need solutions. They need successes. Um, agendas. Well, what are the relevant topics? What is new? Uh, that might also differ between uh, academia and, and uh, uh, policymakers. The language differs. We use a more technical uh, and disciplinary language as opposed to what administ administrators and politicians do. The discourse is completely different. We rely on peer review and not on hierarchic administration. This is, you have to keep that in mind if you really want to push your points into uh, the policy world. Then also the time frame, it's about long term and short term. I mean, sustainable development is such a difficult thing for policymakers and administrators to work in four year terms. And they, you know, like four year thinking, this is, this is kind of, you have to cut it down, you have to make it smaller and provide small successes. The incentive structure is different. We look <coughs> of in uh, peer-reviewed papers and NSF grants and uh, um, politicians of political votes and offices. The governance is different. Yeah, it's an expertocracy versus administration. Risk, I think the risk um, uh, uh, is also risk taking is quite different and also the type of expertise. So yes, there are different worlds and it's really a, uh, um, I think my point is if you're aware of that and you don't have wrong expectations, um, then it's absolutely workable. It's like talking, like learning another language maybe. Uh, I mean, you can, uh, it's, it's not unsurmountable. <laughs> Talk about money. <laughs> Significant reliable long-term funding. Um, I think we're also pretty privileged in, in Germany. I just brought you the latest, like from two weeks ago. There's this new program called the Copernicus Project. I mean, if we go, we go really big, like for Copernicus, <laughs> supporting the Energiewende. Uh, and they, uh, the, the Ministry of, that's from the Ministry of Research and, and uh, Education. And they just picked four consortia uh, a funding of 10 years, 230 partners, and 400 million euros, just for the topic of the energy transition. Wow. I'm a guest professor at a small German university. This is me. <laughs> so it is, it is there again. I mean, it could be done better, but I think we do have this basic buy-in by uh, also the, the academies and uh, the whole academia. 
And then there's something that I also think that really is very important because I've been a uh, consultant in the Ministry of Education and Research for many years. And I read this big FONA, this big framework uh, program on uh, sustainable development for social sciences. And it was about to end and to fade out. And no one was really happy with that. And then there was what? There was free love at Fukushima. And the whole picture changed. So within six months, I saw the same Minister of Science who was about to close down the project to open it up and to double the amount of uh, the, the formal research program. Um, so very, very briefly, I think, I think talking about drivers for transformation, I mean, there could be a vision that's probably the ideal thing. It could be a crisis. I think that crisis, as long as they're not a catastrophe, can be kind of useful and helpful. It could be knowledge. This is what we probably would like to have, but is also usually not enough. And also big technological shifts. I mean, this is actually, this is, this is critical. These people can kind of study transitions and transformations over a long time. And what actually kind of, I mean, did, and really changed the picture was unfortunately a crisis that was three eleven in Fukushima, and back in Germany, uh, the, uh, the then government decided to make this what is now called the energy vendor, the energy transition, which was actually the transition of a tra transition of a transition. <laughs> um, I don't want to go back into detail. Don't want to go into details, but um, again. Um, it was a somehow surprising move, but very uh, radical move that included what? I tried to uh, put it in a nutshell. It's about phasing out nuclear power until 2022, and we're very well on our way. It's the complete transformation of the energy system towards renewables. We're very well on our way. Uh, it's about replacing nuclear and fossil fuels. That also means coal. That is a big issue because that has to do with jobs and in Eastern Germany. Um, yeah. F the idea of fighting climate change and phasing out nuclear as two sides of the same coin. And also the idea of a Gemeinschaftswerk, which means something you do together. So it was very clear that such a tremendous transition, I mean, transition of from a energy system owned by basically four huge very powerful energy providers to a more decentralized and multi-actor energy system and from from 15% uh, of nuclear to down to in 2022 to zero is that's quite something so you need all the forces uh, yeah so I think what also helped, and also is part of that, I would say, I mean, slight success of what we have today is a case of proof of concept. I mean, there were many not successful things and many things that did not went well, but kind of as a balance, I think, success, there were more successes than failures. And this is, of course, also what politicians need in order just to stay in office. I mean, simple things like staying in office. Um, I don't know about next year, there will be the federal national elections in 2017, and um, we'll see how it's going to work. The energy transition, and I really want to spend five minutes on that because it's just so core to all, to the whole transition debate in, in not just in Germany, but also in, in Europe. And this is, by the way, the best website. Uh, it's from the Green Party Foundation. If you have any questions on the German energy transition, this is the way where you want to go. And again, and just to give you a flavor, um, this is our closing down of the nuclear power plants, which is pretty uh, well, pretty well uh, entitled. When I said it was a transition of the transition of the transition, this is because that has started before. I mean, that was not a sudden decision. But it, there was a blueprint how to do that. And also the other types of technologies were there. Um, so it was kind of at least feasible. The, uh, that's the, uh, um, also some good news, of course, I'm going to pick good, good news now. That's also here that the, the GDP and shared renewables in power generation are actually on a uh, 
pretty good uh, track, at least good when you see that from an economist point of view. Also, it's good for the jobs, so it's not that we're back to stone age and people are out of work and uh, the economy is going down, it's pretty much the contrary. Um, yeah, that's, that's the plan. It's a very long way. It's up to 2050. And actually, you really need all of them, all, all of the actors, to, to uh, go along. And unfortunately, I don't have much time to, to go into that. But a good and transparent plan where everyone who really has a stake in, and has interest in, has economic interest in, is involved in some way or the other is absolutely key. And then also, I think one thing that is makes it this Gemeinschaft track is that um, the people are behind it. They're still behind it, although energy prices have, I mean, they did rise, they, they increased. And so if you look at today, um, it is basically also a democratic movement. So the blue ones are citizens and co-ops um, owning renewables. It's only renewables, right? I mean, we have don't own nuclear or coal, coal uh, power stations, uh, and, uh, and the energy suppliers are, they, it's still a very kind of a, a small percentage. So what I want to say is that it's really uh, in the hand of, of many, and it, very interesting new business cases have developed that are also um, um, quite successful in the end. And this is also a slide, uh, of course, I, uh, I'm happy to show because 92% of the Germans support further growth of renewables, which means support the energy the even in 2014. So this is three years after the first changes. And yes, prices have increased. And yes, there have been tremendous um, debates and challenges also regarding infrastructure prices. Okay, so. Summing up, um, what does it take uh, to promote the sustainability uh, transformation? Uh, and I want to share with you some some um, some learnings from another recent research project that was that uh, was done um, kind of um, uh, on the back of class of these uh, the, uh, and the human, the transformation. And some of you might be uh, familiar with that type of transition management. Uh, multi-level perspective idea that has been developed in the Netherlands. So the idea is that transitions take place on, on uh, actually three different levels where transitions are um, well are relevant. So is at, at the core that's regime level. This is really where the action takes place. That that's the current regime. And then on the landscape level, there might be things like Fukushima, like, um, but also societal phenomena, refugees coming in, for instance, in, in the millions, that do actually uh, exert pressure on the regime level to change. And then there is the innovations level, the niche level. This, that's kind of a, 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 a space for, for innovation, social innovations, technological innovations, that might now have the right time, it might be the right time for them to come up to the, to the, to the regime level to be used and integrated in a changed regime. And I think this is a, quite a nice way to, to think about transitions. And then there's elements that, are, that can be changed intentionally. There's other things that cannot be changed. I mean, there are hardly be changed by those elements <laughs> on the regime level. And to get a bit closer to this level of regime, because this is where the action really takes place, where you can do change this also where the interface, the policy research interface takes place. It's a bit another uh, view. But, uh, uh, view. Um, this is also called the transformation puzzle. Um, and that has been, I, I really should acknowledge, mm -hmm. that has been developed by colleagues from the Öko Institute, I'm a um, he was the coordinator of that project. And what we see is there's in the in the uh, in, in the center, this is this is kind of the entry point, how to change the regime. So this is about values and models, it's about behaviors and lifestyles, it's about technologies, it's about I mean who are the 
you know, how does the energy system actually look like? It's about physical infrastructures. You have to change uh, the physical infrastructure if you want to change an energy system. It's all about research, education, knowledge. These are all entry points. And there's also, what it also shows, there's different methods that you could, one could try, different ways to go from change management to exploration to real life experiments. Of course, you need lots of conflict management. Um, terms of participation and ownership and mission and goals, okay. My timer tells me that I should stop. Uh, I'll do that in a minute. So these are the different entry points. And uh, I could, or we did actually, for the, the end event and also for the what we call the food transition and the mobility transition. There's, it's a nice concept to, to, to think about uh, and to work with scenarios and with different um, um, policy tools and mixes of policy tools to, to really have an impact on this innovation. When I say we or you, I talk about different type of actors and there's many different type of actors in the room. Also taken from that research is this, I think, very nice overview or conceptualization of transformation actors, which is the economy and businesses. I very much believe in um, in entrepreneurs and also in kind of competition in that field to be because the leverage is is so big. Uh, but what I think what, what what companies really need is good ideas, um, good allies, reliable frameworks, political framework, and they might indeed be very very helpful in, uh, in uh, as transformation actors. Of course, civil society, academia, thus, you need the media to drive the agenda, and the state actors, and uh, I mean, when I talk about government or state actors or policy, this is of course also very multifaceted. It's local authorities. We need a lot of local authorities, a lot of local movement. And as I said, I think like communities and cities are the best level to really try out new things. The regional states, the federal government, and we also always have to think of EU. What is the EU doing? They're not only doing terrible things, they're also doing great things. Just to mention one, there's this new regulation on sustainable procurement, on procurement. So yes, it is now, all the governments can now um, um, issue procurement um, rules that are that kind of prioritize sustainability issues as opposed to just economic issues. So, I mean, in your terms, you don't have to take the cheapest caterer, you can take a caterer for your conference or for your, uh, for your project uh, that comes with um, organic and you know, fair trade products, to put it very simply. And this is, I mean, this is, it sounds like, like a tiny thing, but it does change. So the, here is a good, a positive example for the EU. Yeah, and then of course the international community are talking about that. And uh, if you're interested in that, this is the, the, the final report. It's, it, uh, it's published about six months ago as a little English uh, booklet uh, with Adi Kinsama as the main author. I think it's really worth it uh, for, for those who are interested in transitions. And this is my last slide, um, try to, to, to wrap up some, some, some learnings. Reliable governance is, um, should not be underrated. It does not mean if you don't have that kind of you know, elaborate sustainability governance that it doesn't work. Um, but it makes, makes sense to create structures. Sound management and independent monitors. The question is always when you have those action plans and, and, and strategies, who's doing the monitoring? And this is also where civil society and NGOs have a very important place to uh, and role to play because they are really independent. <coughs> Pushed and back up as a strong mission. I had I showed one example. It could be something completely different in other countries. I do a lot of work in Sweden. In Sweden, 
the, uh, the the energy is the energy system is not that much of the political agenda. It's more the refugee crisis that does also really push the agenda there now. Usually enforcing multi-level governance. That was the idea of having thinking in landscape, regime, and niche level. Multidisciplinary approaches, which two sides if you want to. The funding is something to work for. It's also good to have the big dinosaurs with you, which are in Germany at least the national academies. They are typically more conservative, but it also takes a long way and a long time to kind of change them from within. Uh, it's not always fun, believe me, because you know you. I mean, like yesterday, I was kind of <laughs> to, uh, uh, accused of being not radical enough. Typically, in my typical work environment, I'm the radical. <laughs> I'm the communist. I'm the radical. So um, it's an inter interesting uh, uh, change of uh, uh, perspectives. Okay, the municipalities. Something that happened here to the uh, the uh, animation. The media. To the public agenda. And then also um, something I do believe in, as I said, try to put to, to take the, the uh, um, industry along on the green race because the leverage is just just <coughs> and I think that goes for all what we talk. What has the impact? Um, that is probably the most important. Thing. Thanks a lot for your patience listening to me. on the last day of this SCORIDE conference. Uh, much appreciated on behalf of myself, the SCORIDE board, and everybody else here today. So just a small, I know you've probably packed your bag already, but uh, this is uh, maybe not so small, but at least flat. So, uh, <laughs> I was really looking forward to getting that. Oh, well, uh, For three days, I was looking at the whale. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully, it'll, it'll, it'll make it back home in, um, Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. So, um, Lucia needs to be on her way in a short while this morning to catch a bus back to the airport. Um, but we do have about 12, 15 minutes of time for some questions and discussion. Let me just move over to the, to the microphone. Um, so let me, I saw Lucy's hand first, and then Audley, um, and then here down in front. So um, Lucy, if you just please try to keep it short and succinct so we can try to move on to as many people as possible. Thank you very much. I found that very interesting. It, it's really nice to hear the, the, what's going on in Germany. Um, I'd quite like you to reflect on your own role in this process. So um, uh, you kind of showed us what you thought was important in terms of achieving Success, but what is what is it? What, what does it mean for you? Um, what's the practice of being this person that sits between um, policy and research? How did you get into it, and how does it fit with the rest of your role as an academic? So, how does it fit into your life? I'm quite interested to hear that. In the, the 22 months <laughs> I spent in meetings, um, <laughs> how did I get into it? Um, I'm a um, there's 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 a um, several several answers. Um, I think I mean very practically, the first time I was asked to serve in one of those uh, councils was on the National Council on Consumer Affairs and Food by a national uh, the Ministry of Food and Consumers back then, uh, and. Uh, I really think it was, I would call it, because I, I just got my PhD, I was very, that was in 2002. Um, and I think there were just not very many people out there with an expertise in consumer policy and consumer research. That was kind of really, um, yeah, um, not, 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 not a topic that was really, it was also not never a career topic, by the way. Mm -hmm. Same for sustainability. So I think the, the, the combination of 
having some ideas on sustainable development and consumer research, consumer policy was kind of my first kind of introduction. Mm -hmm. And then I, I don't know, somehow you might get stuck <laughs> in different different type of, of uh, um, we also, I mean, that's also something that, um, um, something kind of, kind, of, uh, kind of funny because I, I do most of my work in, in uh, Scandinavia and there is, I mean, it's like, you know, we don't really have the big gender issue. I mean, yes, in some way, yes, but I mean, you would never come in a room and have uh, 90 men and two women. So I think one of uh, why my tickets uh, is also just being a woman and an economist. Um, that uh, like with the, when I was a, um, you wanted to do personal stories. So when I was elected to the National uh, Academy of Sciences, I was, that was one of those moments when I came to the room and I looked around and said, something is wrong here. And it was indeed 92 men and two women, right? So this is, I think this is also uh, an issue. So diversity um, is uh, probably um, something that also might just help bringing different type of voices in uh, processes, in, uh, in councils. What does it do to me? Um, I think you, I get very, very uh, realistic and very pragmatic. Maybe less visionary, that might be the, the downside. Um, but also maybe thankful or grateful if I say, see that things are moving ahead, and sometimes they do. Looking back, I mean, you, you, if you would know before what's actually going to work and what really is actually going to have an impact, you would, I know, that would be good because then you could focus. You know, I mean, things develop. And very often, like this concept I was pointing to, was the first time ever where consumer policy was an issue at all. And then also the sustainability council was pretty new. So you, you know, looking, looking back. Um, and um, yeah, I think the only thing. Um, that uh, you also get more, um, yeah, more realistic about what you, what you can really do and what you cannot do. Um, in the sense of, I was really pleased that <laughs> serving on this so-called ethics committee, that was the committee the chancellor um, uh, united after or to kind of to write this paper on the energy transition, energy transition. That was actually the first time ever, and that probably the last time, <laughs> that a, a, a concept developed by a group, by a council, was actually put into practice and put into laws, I think 12 different laws within a time frame of six months. That was an amazing thing that it really, you know, that it really happened. Um, but there is, I mean, many, many things that you work on for many years and they never see the light, and uh, I'd love to be with that. Okay, I promised Audley. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, really, really stimulating talk and very interesting too. Um, now, I'm going to try and keep this short. Basically, I don't like ironing. You don't like ironing? Ironing. Okay, I like wrinkles. <laughs> okay, so I'm wondering about um, how you might tell this story of the energy vendor keeping the wrinkles in, you know, the, the, the politics, the messiness. <coughs> Sometimes when we adopt, I am a critic of the multi level perspective as well, and <laughs> so now you know where I'm coming from. It takes the neaten up the story a little too much. So, can you say a little bit more about, for example, the challenges connected with uh, the incumbent power producers and getting them to see the energy vendor as legitimate. Oh yeah, I mean, I could have probably five talks about the wrinkles. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, I think, uh, I mean, actually, where to start? I mean, specifically on the, I'm not going to talk about the mental health. The, the um, industry influence and lobbyism is, of course, that's something I did not really, I mean, I mentioned it briefly, but this is, of course, um, it's a major issue. And in most of those, those councils, take, take another council, take the Bioeconomy Council. 
Bioeconomy has been debated for a long time only in the economic gains and economic you know, opportunities. And I know I'm well aware that in different countries this is still debated that, that, uh, that way. Uh, but here the, the, um, I think the, the interesting thing is to, to make use of it. And also what we did in the German context is to not reinvent, but maybe rewrap the project, which means the project is again comes again with millions of euros to wrap it with a sustainability agenda and to link it to the SDGs. So these are things you can do even in a field that is strongly, I mean, in the hands of industry interests like the bioeconomy. I could tell similar stories from the you know, energy system. The same thing with big food. I mean, food is a, I mean, yeah. Subsid European um, subsidy policy is uh, probably something We've come across. Um, yeah, I mean, what what, what can I say? This is, I decided to um, to uh, uh, I think this is what I was asked to do to to focus on the interface between policy and and research and how to make it work. And I also think I I got a um, maybe that's just a very personal feeling, but I heard a lot of doomsday things here and a lot of negative messages. <laughs> and uh, well, there's a lot of it is true. I, I still don't think that makes people going. Mm. I think you need a few successes, a few good stories, a few, few positive stories that at sometimes you know, the right time and the right uh, yeah, coalition and then things might fly. Okay, just very quickly, we got a couple of more minutes, Jean, and then if we have time, Philip. Hi, Lucia, thank you very much. Um, I, I think my question, I have two comments, I don't know if it's a question. Our friend within relativity. So when you said, I'm radical over there and over here, I'm not radical enough. So maybe it's somehow in there. I guess over the years, I've, when people show slides uh, with using the nation state as a, as a unit of analysis, I'm looking for border adjustments, and so sometimes, sometimes I don't know what it means when somebody says, oh, look at the jobs in Germany, look at how this is good, because I'm thinking, okay, what happened beyond Germany to create this? That's just one thing. The other thing is I find what you explained was what I've started calling the German environmental exception. And um, what there's a nice paper out by Dreisek et al. who talk about the 90s and the social movements and the green, um, how the green orientation got institutionalized into the core of the state in Germany. So I'm sitting in the United States and I'm going, gee, wow, like how do we get there, right? right? And so I guess I'm sort of seeing that you kind of glossed over the origins. And maybe for you it's just very self-evident, but uh, the, the social movements that happened, the Green Party and that stuff that sort of pushed that into to us. Absolutely. Yeah. I had, I had, I had to pick, um, pick and choose, but you're absolutely right. And uh, the, um, um, the the study, the, the latest, uh, the, the last research project I shared with you, that the Rainer Christian, I mean, the Öko Institute itself, which is a product of the Green Party, yeah. and that that is kind of the inventor of the energy change of the energy transition back in the 1980s. So the first book on the energy vendor is actually edited by this person um, on in the 1980s. And you're absolutely right, is this that did not happen. I mean, that was kind of the disaster, that was the crisis that kind of um, sparked the, the, the actual political change, but it could not have happened without this societal and, and political and also technological preparation that has been done for, for decades. That's absolutely for sure. So the question is, sometimes when I'm in, you know, them, just on the energy when it talks uh, in, uh, in different countries in Europe, like France, I mean, they, they just couldn't do it. There's none of that. They don't have the political, they don't have the societal, they don't have the technological, they don't have the structural, structural base to actually do that within a short time frame. So um, thank you for um, um, pointing to that definitely um, very, very important um, preparation work. Okay, we've got, uh, we're out of time, but Philip, quickly, okay. please. <laughs> Very quickly. First of all, uh, uh, <coughs> Lucia, 
thank you so much to, to come out of your comfort zone and talk about your own role in this tension between research and policy. I think it's really greatly appreciated. So thank you for that. And I know that it was a, a, a somewhat steep journey for you. I have three very quick points. Uh, you don't need to respond to any of them. <laughs> One is the sense of urgency. Bill Rees and John Ehrenfeld both pointed at that, you know. And the wind is blowing in our face, and if you piss in the wrong direction, uh, you know what's <laughs> happening. So, um, in, in stories like this, you don't get a sense of urgency. It's a grinding, slow process. Second, the role of social movements and citizens. On the one hand, we see the hope for a groundswell of citizens to push the politicians into change. We didn't really talk a lot about that. On the other hand, on the other hand, there is a disconnect between climate change and our every, own everyday behavior. And that awareness is still missing. Third, uh, also with John Ehrenfeld, uh, the role of research, we need to move from knowledge to understanding. And the multi-level perspective may actually a sort of help with that, right? That we see the complexities visualized. It's not so much about data, at least in my view, it is about really in transdisciplinary uh, science to understand how to make a transition. Thank you. Okay, do you want to respond? He said I should not come in another <laughs> All right, so we'll let that hang out there. Philip, thank you very much. Lucia, thanks again.